good night wherever you are down in watching we appreciate it thank you for dialing in again uh, as always we appreciate people who watch these videos uh, if you have any comments or suggestions or prayer requests go ahead and hit us up on uh, our website at webbaptist.com or go over to Facebook and uh, leave a message or someone on our, our page and uh, we'll be glad to respond to any requests or concerns you may have. Uh, thank you again for dialing in. Uh, please like, share, subscribe uh, the video. Uh, the more subscription, uh, subscription, if you're subscribed to the channel, excuse me, uh, then you're going to be able to um, get notifications of when I make these videos, and uh, and it also helps our our uh, exposure with YouTube as far as getting more people to see the videos. Uh, and, and just spreading the word of Christ is what we're trying to do here. Again, we thank you for dialing in uh, and subscribing and being part of this channel. Uh, today's topic is going to be about the high places. Uh, our pastor uh, a couple weeks ago did a sermon on the high places and it was really good. And uh, he asked me to kind of expound on it or follow up with that with uh, one of these topic videos. And so that's what we're doing today uh, in regards to uh, just the topic of the Bible. Now, what is the, the high places? Okay, well, uh, in a nutshell, it, it's places of worship. Now, we're going to get into some more of the details, but in some areas we're going to have broad strokes. In some areas, we're going to get in a little bit more detail for the simple reason that uh, if we go through too much, then we're going to have a completely different uh, Bible lesson or study or topic in regards to the subject, whereas right now I just want to kind of give a brief overlay of what these things are, how they came to be, and why God detests them so much. So when we look at high, high, high places, and again, I'm looking at my notes, uh, they're ele elevated places of worship, okay? And sometimes, um, you know, they often include an altar or a sacred object like a stone pillar uh, or wooden poles of various shapes and sizes. If you want to uh, refer them to totems, that's pretty accurate as well. Um, they refer to animals, constellations, uh, goddesses, gods, fertility, uh, natural deities. For the most part, the ancient people, whatever was going on in their world that was outside their comprehension or outside their um, normal day and, and something magnificent, then of course they would worship that. Uh, so they had, of course, uh, in the ancient days, you're looking at the fact that the, uh, the sky with all the miracles going on at night, you see a lot of constellations and stars and that kind of stuff. So those things that really uh, were magnificent, that really enthralled them, um, the seasons, that kind of stuff, they tend to worship those same kind of things. And, and they put them into a, a form that they could identify and worship and put reverence to. Uh, so that's what we got going on here. Sometimes the artificially elevated, what I mean by that, sometimes they built uh, altars or um, platforms. They built them up out of stone. Uh, so uh, they weren't necessarily just on a high hill and they put a bunch of poles up there. Sometimes they were, they were pretty elaborate. And uh, some, uh, sometimes they're on high places and hills, uh, as we see in 2 Kings 16.4. Uh, sometimes, like in Jeremiah 7.31, uh, they're down in valleys. So you have more, most time when they're elevated or they're in a place like a valley, they, it's a place where you can see it from pretty much all directions or, or most of the directions. Uh, or in 2 Kings 23, 18, they had them at a city gate. Of course, everybody passed through a city gate, high traffic area, so everybody would see it. Or they would have it at the end of every street, uh, as we see in Ezekiel 16, 25, 31. So they had um, these high places, these sacred places for the most part were varied. There were many. Uh, they, they were from, you know, they could be something so simple as wooden poles on a hill or in a glen or, or by a river uh, at a brook or something. Or they could be something more elaborate like a small temple with priests and sometimes prostitutes there at the temple, again, for fertility rites and, and that kind of stuff. They varied widely depending on the base feelings of the people living there. And uh, they really, for the most part, as varied and so many and multiple of them, depending on what they believed and what they felt 
was needed to, to, to worship. Uh, so, uh, and of course, what was going on in their region. Uh, so that, that's what was going on there. Uh, so that's what they are. They're places of worship to whatever God uh, that they felt needed to be appeased at that time. And like I said, it could be the constellations, some stars. It could be uh, the seasons. Uh, it could be just about anything. Uh, it just depends on you know, what was needed. That's what it was for. So who built them and what was their purpose? Well, in that region, you got the Canaanites, Amorites, Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Amalekites, and finally, Israelites. So just about everybody in this region uh, had a culture of uh, paganism uh, and, and multi, you know, just a, a multi, a plethora of beliefs uh, that reflected their base feelings, their base ideas, and, uh, and, and the world around them, interpreting the world around them. So pretty much everyone that land uh, until you know, Joshua conquered and, and kind of moved in there. So what were they used for? Well, they were used for areas of worship. So how did they worship? You know, usually it was animal sacrifices or burning incense. Uh, in some place, in holding festivals and feasts, you know, you, you have a special festival or, you know, like a, the end of a, a harvest season or the beginning of a harvest season, um, or if there's some kind of tragedy going on in the community, these places would be the place to go for worship, for appeasing the gods and that kind of stuff. Uh, to the extreme, there was, there was human sacrifices as well, and which is uh, <laughs> it's terrible and detestable. Uh, but sometimes they'd sacrifice, uh, you know, virgins. Sometimes they're sacrificing children. Uh, it just depends on what was needed at the time and what they were willing to do. So uh, that's what that was all about. So, and sometimes they would sacrifice their enemies. You know, they have they're always warring. They're, this tribal conflict was going on repeatedly and constantly. So naturally, if you capture your enemy, put them on the altar. So sacrifice them to your God. You know, so that kind of stuff. Now. Uh, usually it was a localized regional worship dedicated to a specific god or goddess, you know, and some, some got more attention than others, but for the most part, you know, whatever was needed, that's what they were going to worship, and that's what they were going to sacrifice to. Once the land of Israel was established, it usually came down to the king. So once the, you know, Israel was, you know, Joshua came in and, and took the land, from then on out, the, 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 the high places, we, we, we see that there's a trouble. You know, you got some kings, most of the kings um, didn't care for them. They felt that it was uh, an added insurance, so to speak. They, they didn't mind having, you know, the, the God of Israel having his own place, his own temple, his own tabernacle. But it was okay to have, a, a, you know, a place of high places for other gods just in case or to appease, you know, the masses. You know, sometimes these people wanted these and not this. So it, it, so it really comes down to when you look at the kings, God would withdraw his presence when they, you know, the, the Israelites were, were worshiping multiple gods, uh, so to speak. They were worshiping these false gods, these false idols. And God was like, I want nothing to do with that. Either you want you worship me or none at all. And so we have a rare case, uh, you know, when Hezekiah and, and, and Josiah, we'll get into those in a minute, that um, they, they were tear down the, the high places and, and start over. And God, of course, would come, would have his presence and, and he would uh, postpone his judgment and he'd be with his people. So that's what we got to look at. Now, if, let's go through the history real quick of the high places. Um, now, if we look in the Old Testament, we, we could easily make the mistake that high places were done by some of God's people. Uh, for instance, Abraham or Abram, Jacob and Joshua did, uh, did certain things that we, we look at as far as altars and pillars go. So uh, in Genesis 12, 6, 6, 8, Abraham built altars to the Lord at Shechem and Hebron. Okay, And then in 22... Uh, one and two, Abraham built an altar to sacrifice his son Isaac. Okay, so um, these were, for the most, mar most part, these were memorials to what was going on at the time. God did not say, this is where you will worship me. Uh, at any time did he say that. There was a reason for those going on at that time because that was a signif significant event for Abram or Abraham at that time. Uh, so, of course, sacrificing his son 
uh, he, he made a worthy area, a worthy altar for that sacrifice because his son was worth it uh, to his God. Uh, of course, God stayed his hand. Uh, the altar was forgotten. You don't see that area as a place of worship. It's not, it's not a high place. It's an event that happened. It was a memorial to what was God testing Abraham and making sure he had, you know, and making sure that Abraham understood that the fullness and the trust to him is what is needed. And God really blessed him for that. So, and then of course you look at Jacob uh, 28, uh, 18 through 19, he set up stone, stone pillars. And for the most part uh, in Joshua 4, 12, Joshua set up stone pillars after crossing the Jordan. These are not high places just to, to emphasize. Uh, these were memorials and, and you'll see throughout uh, the, the Old Testament is replete with times when stone um, markers were made uh, and, and, and uh, names were given at certain places geographically that a significant event to one of the, the forefathers or, or, or the people of Israel. And the reason for that was a memorial. It had nothing to do with worship. It's like, we, you know, in D.C., Washington, D.C., in our country, uh, you go to Washington, D.C. for a lot of memorials. Do you not? You go there for the Vietnam Memorial. Now we got the World War II Memorial. We go there to remember the, those significant events in our country's history. We don't go there to worship God, okay? So the memorials, you go to remember, pay respect, pay tribute, you know, depending on if you have Memorial Days. You know, a lot of your... Uh, Vietnam veterans would go there to the to the wall um, and that kind of stuff, okay? So when you go to a memorial, you're, you're kind of paying respects to an event that happened in history. Uh, same thing over there with Pearl Harbor. You know, they still have the memorials over there for the USS Arizona. But we don't worship God there, okay? There, 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 there's not a temple there. There's not there's not a church there, okay? It, it's it's a memorial. It's not a, it's a, you, you understand where I'm coming from? Good, let's move on. <laughs> So now when we start getting into the, the problems, we'll start looking at Deuteronomy 12, 4, 5. And here God instructs his people not to worship God in that way, but to seek the place the Lord chose to place to make his habitation there. Okay, so what we're looking at is God is saying, I'm going to choose a place where you can worship me. Okay, you're not going to put me on a high place. I will tell you where I'm going to put you. So keep that in mind as we're moving forward. Now, now we also look at Samuel and, and Solomon, blessing sacrifices made to uh, because at the uh, made offerings because no house had been built yet in the name of the Lord, as we see in First Kings three um, um, uh, three tw uh, three two. When the temple was built, all other practices were ended, and God instructed all places to be destroyed. Okay, so before the temple. You know, they, they were kind of willy-nilly, and they were trying to, and they were paying tribute. And, of course, you had the prophets uh, wandering the land, uh, speaking and, and seeking God. But once the temple was built, God said, this is where I'm at. This is where you'll come and worship. Do not worship anywhere else. Rip down those high places. We don't need them, okay? So he made that clear on how to worship him and where. God, God does not want to share a spot with any other idol or any other place. Okay, he just will not do that. He's not going to share the space because, for one, he's real, and these idols are not. We make them real, thinking that there's something to them, but they're false. They're pagan. They're they're, they're no good. Okay, and God, it's an affront to him. It's an insult to him, because there's no competition at all. Okay, so and we see that replete you know, where the prophets consistently confronted, especially like Jeremiah confronted the, um, uh, you know, the, the prophets and the prophetess of uh, these false gods and, and, and shamed them. But yet people still believed in them. So it's interesting to note at this point in time, when we look at the history, that God's tabernacle was in the wilderness, was on a plain, and it was close to the people. It was not up in a high place. It wasn't a far away and set aside from his people. No, the tabernacle was close to his people, okay? So he wasn't out of the way. You did, and that's pretty interesting when we look at the tabernacle. And it was a very simple setup, okay? It wasn't, he had instructions on what they, how they needed to build it and all that kind of stuff. But for the most part, 
It wasn't elaborate. It was, it was made to be close to his people. And that's pretty, pretty amazing. It wasn't high up and out of the place, out of the way. It wasn't, you know, just a sacred spot. No, it was his, the sacred spot for God was right next to his, his children. So that's pretty interesting. So, so what did God command and what happened? So when we start looking at this, how, why was it a problem? And, you know, how did we come to that problem is, is what we're looking at. So if we look at Numbers 33, 32, and I'm going to try to put those verses next to the video. Uh, I know that I'm throwing a lot at you, but you can go back and look at this and research it uh, on your own. Uh, when the Israelites first entered the land, they were told to destroy the high places. So when Joshua and them, they were moving in, it was time to take back their, take their land that was promised to, the, to Abraham. And God said, okay, here we go. We're going to go in here. We're going to stay. But this is what you got to do. You got to take tear down all worship that is in here. Destroy all the high places. You destroy all the idols. Destroy every molten image. What does that mean? Every carving, everything that they, every piece of metal that they beat into some kind of reverence, be it a trinket, a ring, a necklace, a headgear, all that stuff, destroy it. God wanted all that stuff, that stuff destroyed. Because why did he do that? Well, God, he was the God of his people, right? He didn't want no other gods before him. Look at the first commandment. So going in there, for one, well, why did he pick on the Canaanites? Well, he really didn't pick on them. Uh, the Canaanites, for the most part, were at a tipping point, God all the way back to Abraham and when they were the Amorites. So hey, they were wicked from day one. And God said, you know, judgment's going to come to you sooner or later. Well, guess what? It came because God brought it. He said, I'm going to bring you judgment, and it's going to come in the form of Joshua and, the, and my children. So, but he told his children, wipe out all evidence of their idleness, uh, of their idols, excuse me, all evidence of their beliefs, of their, of their worship, their human sacrificing, all that stuff. We're going to wipe it out. So, um, and Deuteronomy 12, uh, when you look at 12, 2, 3, they were instructed not to worship at the places where the Canaanites sight. So it's not like he said, wipe out all the graven images, wipe out all the idols, to burn and destroy everything, and do not worship me in those places. Okay, so God, God is just totally abstained. He's telling his people, we're going to wipe this out from history, and we're going to do away with it. Now, here's the tough part is and when we look at uh, Deuteronomy 20, 16, 17, because again, we're, we're going through a lot. There's a lot in Deuteronomy that the instructions are given to uh, Joshua and the people about what they needed to do. They're just going to run in there and kill everybody. That's one thing. But God was saying, you need to move in there and go in there, and I want you to do not leave anything that breathes. Okay, and that's a pretty... Pretty hard reality for us to, to look at. With our modern sensibilities, we're like, why would God order Joshua to kill man, woman, child, livestock, whatever, whatever breed? Just wipe it out. Uh, so it's difficult for us to understand, and I'm not going to get into the details of that because that is more, it, it's, it's not a battle between the Israelites and the Canaanites. It's a battle between God, which is good, and evil, okay? So it really comes down to, and th those roots go all the way back to, Abraham, okay? So I don't want to get deep into that because it's a separate issue t entirely, uh, but uh, God was justified in doing it, and I'll explain why. So he's telling his people, when you go in here, we're going to wipe everything out because I want you to start off with a new slate. Think of it like this, okay? God comes to you and says, okay, I want you to have this house and 40 acres of land, but what you need to do is you need to take all the stuff out of the house, all the furnishings, all the appliances, all the beds, all the sheets, all the clothes, take it out and destroy it. Burn it. Don't even give it to goodwill. I want you to burn it. I want you to destroy it. Okay? The reason for that is God wants you to depend on Him totally and entirely. Bring everything that you own into the house. Whatever you work for, you will bring in. You will, I, I will bless you and you will have. Okay? So you're supposed to walk into this house with no appliances, no furniture, no clothes, no nothing. All you have is the, the house itself and the 40 acres, okay? So you go in and you start throwing everything out and you realize, 
well, wait a minute, I probably need some sheets for tonight. I probably need a refrigerator for tonight. I probably need this, that, and the other. You're not, getting, you're not listening to God's instruction. That's the, that's the first problem, is you're not listening to what God's telling you to do, and you're thinking, well, it's okay because I'm going to need this. I, I, I is what's talking to you and not what God has instructed for you. And you're stuck with some old appliances that half work, don't work. Down the road, they break down. And then you're in trouble because you didn't rely on God to bless you with a brand new one. So that's kind of where we are with this, okay? So God wanted them to take over this land and he wanted to burn it. Uh, all the imagery, all the idleness, all the idol, idolatry, excuse me, the human sacrifices, he did not want to be associated with these unclean, sinful people, okay? So that was what that was all about. Again, it was a battle between good and evil for the most part when God said, look, you need to do this. So in Joshua 21, Joshua conquered the entire Canaanite country in seven years. He defeated 31 kings and divided the land among 12 tribes of Israel as God had directed. Okay, so we're doing pretty good, so he's doing that. However, Joshua left five nations in the land, the Philistines, Canaanites, Sidonites, the Gebelites, and Lebanon. Okay, we see that in Joshua 13, 2, 6. So Joshua made two mistakes when we look at this. Okay, first of all, and you can, again, go back and read those scriptures that I'm giving you. For one, he failed to completely defeat the Canaanites. These are the people that God passed judgment on. These are the people that God said, I'm going to wipe you out. These are the people that were evil. They practiced evil uh, and human sacrifice. They were just uh, abhorrent. God, God wanted them gone, okay? But God didn't wipe, I mean, uh, Joshua did not wipe them all out, and he should have. Now, he, fi- he failed to wipe out the cults and the idols that came with that, okay? So he goes into the land, he's conquering, he's wiping, he's killing out, and he's burning everything. But if you don't kill everything, if you don't wipe out everything, it's just going to grow back. It's kind of like a cancer in the nation of Israel. And so uh, he didn't see it right away, but you know, you, you take slaves of uh, the men and the daughters and the, the children, you make them slaves that well, they still got their beliefs, do they not? Yes, they do. And those beliefs somehow filter into the, uh, the, the God's children. So next thing you know, there's idolatry on their property and in their households from their slaves. And, and you see these elaborate or, or elaborate trinkets and these beautiful trinkets and, and reverence that these slaves are holding dear. And it's enticing to, to, to the children because that's just human nature. It, it appeals to your base beliefs. So uh, especially if you're talking about something that is um, like infidelity or not fidelity, but, you know, uh, fertility, you know, if, uh, you know, if, they're, if, there's, if they're worshiping wine, guess what? That appeals to that those people who love to drink wine. Uh, if it appeals to sexual activity, guess what? That's going to appeal to our base nature. And uh, the children of guilty, uh, children of Israel, uh, God's people are, are not uh, absolved of that. They, they're not above sin. Uh, they're just like you and me, you know. So that's where that came from. Uh, so Joshua forgot. You know, his mistake was he didn't defeat all those. He left those five kingdoms around. And uh, he let some of that sin stay in the land. And, and that would come back later down the road to, to, to bother the, the, the children of Israel, uh, of God. Now, Solomon built the temple. Uh, of course, you know, David wanted to build it. But God said, no, you can't do it. I'm going to leave this for, your, for, for Solomon. So Solomon built the temple. But guess what? He brought in a whole new area of worship. He brought in this brand new magnificent temple and said, this is where we worship and, uh, you know, so all the tribes had a, one place they can go to for worship. Well, <laughs> at the same time uh, that he built that, uh, see, so he also built high places for his wife and their foreign gods. So First so Kings 9, 3, we see that. So, okay, God, I, I'll give you a temple over here. And, okay, wife, one, two, three, four, five, you'll have... Uh, you know, places to worship over here, one, two, three, four, five. So Solomon not only built God's temple, but he also built a lot of high places. So for someone, the smartest man in the world, 
they made a boneheaded move, in my opinion. So, um, again, that goes back to the fact that they, the, the, the children of God, Israel, they let people into their society, into their homes, into their faith, into their religion. They had these people coming in, the Gentiles were coming in, and they were bringing these beliefs with them. And this became a cancer, so to speak, to, to their faith and their spiritual well-being. Uh, well and so, um, and, and God was trying to get, get rid of that. And, and God didn't want to do that. So after Solomon, of course, it divided between the two kingdoms. Only Hezekiah and Josiah were the only ones to tear down the high places. The rest of the kings either left them up or re supported them. Uh, so, and, and they, didn't care, they didn't think nothing of it. You know, okay, we can worship God, but we can also worship these other gods as well. So, and that becomes a problem. The disobedience and the rebellion against God, uh, God cut off the royal lines. And, and we see civil strife and foreign wars would happen and eventually exile. They had judgment passed against them. Why did they have judgment passed against them? Because they turned away from God. They accepted these idols. They accepted this worship. They accepted anything other than him. And he blessed this land. He was upholding his end of the covenant. The children of Israel were not. It's that simple. So now, so why did God detest them and what and wanted them removed? Well, to stab off idol, idolatry, idolatry and compromise, the first commandment is clear. You shall have no other gods before me. That's 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 number one. That's the number one rule. And Jesus backed that up too. What did he say? Uh, Jesus said, love your God you know, with all your heart, your mind, your soul. It's the same thing. I have no other gods before me. We needed to be dependent on God on everything, just not on some issues, not just Sunday morning and not Wednesday night, not just during revival. No, we need to be dependent on God for everything and anything in our lives. Okay? So to and also, he wanted to get rid of these problems with the children to prevent future problems because God knew these were going to happen, okay? So the slaves and the Israels owned these things and they would just bring that spiritual corruption and the pagan beliefs within the community. Um, and of course, you know, God was fulfilling this curse he put on Canaan back in Genesis 9, 25. Canaanites were evil, wicked, and ungodly from day one. They just were. Now, to make a point, how serious was God about getting rid of all this? Well, you look at Samuel. Samuel confronted King Saul because King Saul wanted to keep the king, um, I forgot his name, he wanted to keep the king alive in order to, to get a ransom for him. And that's not what God told him to do. Saul was looking at the fact he can make money off of a captured king, okay? And Saul said, no, that's not what God wanted you to do. God will be your provider, not money, okay? And Samuel ended up killing that king and told Saul, God's done with you, okay? So uh, that's just how serious he was. He, God didn't want, didn't understand. It's like if you were to take all these idols that they were ripping down and they would molt down those images and make them uh, into things for God. No, that's not what God wanted. God wanted nothing to do with those things, if we look at how the temple was created, if we look how the tabernacle was created, God was gave very specific instructions, and none of those destructions involved recycled material. None of them, okay? None of it came from the high places. None of them came from other religions. It didn't come from stolen wealth. None of that stuff. It came from the hearts and minds and the work of His children, okay? That's what this was. God would not, did not want to accept a pole that was set up in, over there in the glen to help hold up his tent. That's not what it was. God, he wanted his people to be 100% dependent on him on everything. Okay? So, why does God continue to test them and want them removed? Well, that's kind of a... <laughs> that's just... And, and I always look at these lessons as how, how does this apply to me today, okay? And so that's what it is. What I'm asking you is, you know, where are the high places in your life, okay? So what are those idols that we have in our lives? What is it that we put on a high pedestal, so to speak? It's the same thing. Um, you know, these high places in our lives, what are they? 
If we sit down and really think about it, is it money? Is it career? Uh, is it our hobbies? Uh, do we like to fish in and go hunting more than we go to church? Um, is it our sports teams, uh, our college sports teams, or our professional sports teams? Is it our children? Yes, your children can be an idol. How important are they that they are more important than your marriage? Are they more important that you got to do sports activities on the weekends where you're missing church? Those kind of things. Is your own personal time, I'm guilty of this, I'm thinking, I don't want to be around nobody at all. I want to be home. I want to just relax, enjoy my time. And I look forward to that. And that, that can be my idol because it's all about me. It's not nothing else. It's not what God wants. Instead of coming to church, my idol, my selfishness is stay home, sleep in, and enjoy the weekend without having to deal with any of this. Do what I want to do. That's my idol, me. So is my spouse or your spouse, not mine, but your spouse, is, it, is your spouse a, an idol to you as well? Are they more important than your faith, your careers, all that stuff? You know, we look at all the stuff in our lives and we say, is this more important than, than God? Is this more important than worshiping the God, the first commandment? Have no other gods before me. And that's what we have to look at. God's word is clear on how we need to worship. We don't worship God on our terms. We worship God on His terms, okay? We don't just sit there and pencil Him in and make time to worship Him. God helps us showing a true pattern of worship of Him through His Word, and it's by Him alone, okay? So if you ever have any question on how to worship, open up that Bible. Clear your heart, clear your mind, and listen to what He's telling us, okay? Have no other gods before me. It can't get any clearer than that. So if he is a perfect way to save us with grace, he's going to be the perfect way to show us how to worship. It's that simple, okay? When we try to worship him on our terms, it can be very confusing. It can be convoluted. It can be misshapen. It can be a complete mess. I guarantee you that you're not going to sit there. If those that say that they don't go to church, they worship God at home, I guarantee you you're just not having the same experience as you would in a church. Because you're going to be, the bathroom is too convenient. The TV is too convenient. You're opening up your Bible every now and then or at all. Or you open up a Bible app on your phone and don't even open up the Bible. Okay? So as, I, as we went through the years of COVID where we were locked down, man, I tell you right now, worship was hard for, for me and just about everybody I talked to. Because we get so used to the routines of us when we're at home, not with the routine of God. So that's why we need to sit there and listen to how he does. We cannot dictate worship and like, just like we can't save ourselves. If we can't save ourselves, how can we sit here and say that we can sustain worship of God the way he wants? No, we can't go to God in our terms. We go to God on his terms, okay? We cannot worship God at home, work, nature, or alone and expect the same experience that we do in a church with this fellowship with his believers, okay? So let me look at Matthew 18, 20. It's very important, okay? So that's what we got to look at. So the fellowship of believers, what did God say? Where one and two is gathered, I'll be there as well, okay? Why would you want to neglect that? If you're really wanting to pursue God, get with God's family, okay? So the human heart is, as we know, I mean, it's a factory of idols, it just is. We, we, we produce so many idols in our lives, it's just ridiculous, okay? The idols that you have today will probably not be the same idols you'll have tomorrow. They probably weren't the idols you had 20, 10, 20 years ago or before you were saved. Idols are not, you know, they're, they're bad. They are. Don't get me wrong, okay? And we have those and we got to recognize those and we got to rip them down out of those high places in our heart. I'm guilty of it just as much as anyone. Sometimes, you know, you get a lot of money and you think that's, that, that becomes paramount. You want to hold on to it. You want to spend it. You want to do something with it. Same thing with, you know, when you get married. Um, there's a different idol there. If you're not too careful, children can be an idol. That's not fair to them. It's not fair to God. It's not fair to you. It's just what we do because we, we fall and we're so in love with our children that this happens. But we got to forget, uh, we got to remember and not forget that God deserves all the worship. Nothing else in our lives, okay? The high places are a grim reminder and warning of dangers of worshiping something other than God. So if you ever have any questions of what you're worshiping, 
Just look and see what, how the high places were handled during this time. God did not like those. God does not like idols. He wants nothing to do with them. He doesn't want any compromise. He does not want any, anything to do with them whatsoever. Get rid of them. Tear them down in your life and just dedicate yourself to God. Okay? I appreciate you dialing in and watching. If you, if you, if you have any questions or comments, you know, please leave them over there at the Facebook page or on our website. Go to our website and leave us a message. If you have any prayer concerns or anything, please leave them there. We'll be glad to pray for you and get back in touch with you as, as well. If you can come to Web Baptist, please show up in, uh, at the services. Either on Wednesday night we have dinners, which are really good, and Sunday mornings when we have Sunday school classes, and we also have services. We'd love to have you here. If you cannot attend Web Baptist, get involved in a Bible-based church wherever you're at and see what God has in store for you. I guarantee you that you get with your church family. It will be a blessing beyond measure. Okay? Until next time, take care. God bless.